Welcome to a, another Astrology Night here at Soul Food Books in Redmond, Washington. The first Wednesday night of every month, although we're starting a little late this month. Yeah. The month is well underway. Um, you're all paying a little less to get in tonight, aren't you? Yeah, it's a, it's a good deal, but, you know, we're in Scorpio. And with the sun in Scorpio, that is not the sound of a coffee machine in the background. A small, annoying child has been ground up and will be taken away. <laughs> well, just to get into the, the holiday spirit. But before we get into talking about the month of November, which, as you know, starts with Scorpio and ends with Sagittarius, Rick and I want to share with you uh, some information about a retreat that we do in Brighton Bush Hot Springs, Oregon. Brighton Bush Hot Springs in, in Oregon. Whoops, somehow we got the yeah, – we're good here. Just bear with me here a second. Somehow it didn't hit, happen the way it was supposed to. All right, that but, will be edited out. That and my cruel remarks about the child will not be heard outside this room. Here we um, go again. Welcome to Astrology Night, the first Wednesday night of every month. Here at Soul Food Books, Soul Food Coffee House in Redmond, Washington, I'm Rick Levine and... I'm Jeff Jower and we are going to talk about the astrological activity for the month of November, which starts with the intensity of Halloween-driven Scorpio and ends in the uh, foolishness, fun, and philosophy of Sagittarius. Of Thanksgiving, even. Uh, uh, that, that's right. But before we get to that, Rick and I are doing our ninth annual retreat, the Forecast 2015 retreat uh, at Brighton Bush Hot Springs in Oregon. And Rick has created a little uh, PowerPoint to tell you about what we're doing and what an amazing place it is. Well, Brighton Bush Hot Springs is in the old growth forest up in the hills outside of Salem, Oregon. And this will be the ninth annual New Year's Astrology Conference that Jeff and I are doing this year, 2015, or actually next year, I guess, 2015. It will be January 9th through the 11th. And, um, and it's, a very, it's, it's just a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and it's kind of the same energy as what we have here at Soul Food Coffee House. On Friday night, we get together, the whole group, and we talk about 2015. We look at the outer planets and what they're going to be doing throughout the whole year rather than just the month ahead. And we look at the major planetary cycles, and we try to ground that in a larger perspective. This is the cosmic weather, that which affects all of us. Then on Saturday and Sunday, we go through the charts of each of the participants, and we look for each, in each chart, we look at the major natal aspects and then the significant transits of 2015. And this turns out to be the environment of the weekend where everyone in the workshop gets to know everyone else. And every chart is done as a teaching moment or teaching tool. So we all get the perspective of each other's charts. This is the beautiful main lodge at Brighton Bush. Uh, you know, for those of us living in the Northwest, if you've never been to Brighton Bush, uh, I really encourage you to go. It's an intentional community. It's off the grid. It's a natural wonder and a, a spiritual charge for the soul. And often in January, I think I figured out the other night that five out of eight years that we've done this before, there has been snow on the ground. Not always, but it's um, a very wonderful and magical place. This is the cabins. There's about 40 cabins that sleep uh, two to five people and uh, just a short walk to the main lodge. The hot tubs, of course, are legendary. There are uh, natural hot tubs and uh, tiled hot tubs, both. And the entire ground is really fantastic. It's a pretty good deal, too. The cost is actually $140 if you register by December 15th. And, in fact, they usually do fill up. So if you're considering going, space is limited. Um, and then the lodging and food together, depending upon what you choose for accommodations, is roughly 70 to 100 bucks a night. Um, and that includes three meals a day and, and uh, all the amenities of the, of the place. So um, it's a very fascinating and fantastic place that really is a wonderful experience. You can find out more by going to brightonbush.com. 
Um, and remember, registration is limited. And if you'd like to just make reservations or get more information, you can call 503-854-3320. I feel like I'm on a pledge drive. Well, <laughs> <laughs> so again, if you can join us, that would be great. If you can't, go visit Brighton Bush sometime. Uh, thank you for doing that presentation, Rick. And this is a real good example of Scorpio. The free ride is over, guys. It's quid pro quo. You want something from us? You got to uh, give us something back, like your attention to our commercial. So thanks for doing that, Rick. So now we move into November uh, for real, the astrology of November, the overview, the weather that affects all of us, whether we like wet weather or not. Yeah, and we begin, today is the 5th, Tomorrow, we have a full moon. And it is not an eclipse. We're out of the eclipse season for a while. And as we say here every month, a full moon is a time when the moon opposes the sun and we deal with the crisis of opposition. The crisis, which by the way is also an opportunity to make a breakthrough and a discovery, is between the sun in Scorpio, the sign of measuring resources, of limited resources, and the moon in Taurus, which doesn't even know how to count yet. Taurus is the Garden of Eden. It knows how to count. One to one. To that's one. right. <laughs> so Taurus is just being fat, dumb, and happy. That's my sign. That's why I'm allowed to say it. And Scorpio is lean, mean, and hungry. And it, they, what they're about are resources. S Taurus is, I got my stuff. I'm happy. Scorpio is about the exchange of stuff, what it costs, what it requires. So resource issues like money and self-worth are really highlighted by tomorrow's full moon. You know, you always say the Taurus fat, dumb, and happy line, but you're like only one out of three of those. I'm not going to say which one it is. No, the know. Scorpio part, that <laughs> it'll be, yeah, that'll be a test. Um, we often look at full moons or new moons and we gauge, aside from the fact that, that, all Scorp that all Taurus full moons are a tension between the simplicity of Taurus and the complexity of Scorpio, we look at what angles or aspects the moon is making before and after the actual full moon to get a flavor or a sense of what the full moon is. And this has a couple of things that really fit into the flavor of the month. And one of the things that we need to talk about is the fact that the Sun and Venus are fairly close together, just three degrees apart. So the Moon is not only opposing the Sun, as it always does during a full moon, but is also opposing Venus. Venus is the planet that relates to Taurus. And there is a connection here to the, that sense of value and, and it being, again, more complicated than the Taurus moon would like. Well, it's darn complicated. Anything is too complicated for, for a Taurus moon. <laughs> but it's darn complicated because Venus is the key ruling planet of Taurus, yet it's in Scorpio, the opposite sign. And Venus and the moon are the two primary feminine planets of, of feeling and connecting. So here's Mama Taurus Moon in the kitchen, very happy to, you know, be, be cooking up food for everybody. And her daughter, Venus, comes in dressed like a slut in Scorpio who has an agenda that doesn't go along with the simplicity that uh, Rick ascribed to Taurus. And that's a very good way to look at things. We want things to be emotionally simple, clear, matter of fact. And yet, this full moon is about, no, there's many levels of complexity in relationships of all kinds. The, the, the second level of complexity comes from the fact, although this is after the fact, the moon has just made harmonious trines to a very inharmonious pair of planets that would be a trine to Mars and to Pluto. And this becomes a piece of what the month is. We'll be talking about this as Mars approaches its conjunction to Pluto. But this full moon pulls in that energy a bit too. And although Mars and Pluto are, are difficult energies because they both have agendas, if you will, 
the fact that it's a trine, even though it's after the fact, I think helps us work with this complexity of energies. Right. The trine is a harmonious aspect that says the planets get along and work well together. Mars is the traditional key ruling planet of Scorpio. Pluto is the modern key ruling planet of Scorpio. They are supporting this moon. You know what I think the deal is here? This is really juicy. This can be a very rewarding month if you're willing to do the work to get there. Rather than opposing the simplicity and comfort of Taurus against the complexity of Scorpio and ending the story there, it's saying no. If you're willing to go through the complexity of examining your desires, dealing with the outside world in response to them, and you do the hard work, we'll come back to this Mars-Pluto conjunction, this can be a very resourceful time, a period of time in which you can extract value from yourself, resurrect hidden talents, even, even repair broken relationships if they're valuable enough and you're committed to do the hard work to get there. And I think what we've just talked about in some ways sets the tone for this entire month of Scorpio. There's a number of things that support um, this full moon by what's going to be happening as it unfolds. And I think that Shakespeare would call this foreshadowing. But we've already talked about the Mars coming into Pluto, that being a heavy and intense and, 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 and very powerful conjunction. We have this group of planets, the Sun, Venus, and Saturn in Scorpio, and Mercury, Mercury will join the Scorpio cluster. But what's interesting about this is that we have uh, Venus coming up to a conjunction to Saturn. Again, another heavy energy. We're fe what we're getting here is the fact that the, that the moon in Taurus would like things to be pastoral, bucolic, easy, simple, and it just ain't going to be that way. There's, a, there's one too many or two too many things that are cooking that are suggesting that the energy is building for, for a lot more sense of, of control and passion and power that we're going to have to respond to. Uh, yeah. Uh, um, we have been talking here for years about the ongoing square or 90-degree angle between shocking, liberating, rebellious, live-for-the-moment Uranus and deep, dark, transformational Pluto. And what's happening this month is that Mars, which is the initiator, the instigator, the spark plug, the warrior, the battler, the pioneer, Mars not only joins Pluto, which is getting down to, the, to bedrock work and effort, but Mars then comes and forms a square or a right angle with Uranus, meaning there's a lot of volatility here. And we can either put on our little Taurus comforters and try to hide from the big bad world out there and all, the, and all the demands that are in the world, or we can gear up. Because when the planets get intense collectively, when they get intense in your chart, it means those who gear up and move and match the energy can be happy and productive. And those who aren't willing or able to do that often get run over. They become the unwilling recipients of other people's aggression. You know, Jeff, you've told the story, I think even here, um, about an experience that you had once with an obstin obstinate calf. Yes. Um, yes. And, I, and I think that, that maybe you could even just tell that in a short version, because right. I think that really talks about the resistance that we can have that doesn't serve us. Well, and it raises a good point, because we're all talking about the intensity of Mars, Pluto, and of Scorpio. Well, this little Taurus moon here, even though traditional astrology likes it because it means that we're emotionally and materially comfortable, that has its issues. And it is the resistance to movement, to change, particularly when imposed from the outside. So when I was beginning my astrology practice, I had a friend, Farmer Fleischman, an Orthodox Jewish marijuana farmer in Western Massachusetts. He was religious in every way possible. But he had a little calf on his farm. And the calf had a rope. And I pulled the rope. And the calf just locked up all four legs and would not move. I thought, that's Taurus. 
When given an opposing force, the resistance grows. To get that calf to move, you had to go around next to it and go, come on, sweetie, let's go along together. That's called Libra. That's called joining and overcoming the opposition. So watch where you're stubborn or where somebody else is stubborn, even in their, particularly in their comfort zones, and don't push them or push yourself, but seduce, attract, be a sexy Venus in Scorpio who says, you know, I'm going to manipulate myself or manipulate the other person if that's what it takes to get things moving here because straight on pressure is going to be trench warfare. So this is just the beginning because Mars has a lot on its agenda this month. Well, it does, and you know that Mars agenda, and I think you said this earlier, you know, that Mars, the warrior planet, um, and Pluto, the planet of passion and, the in, and emotional intensity, these two planets are the planets that do the bidding of Scorpio. And we have the Sun in Scorpio, Venus in Scorpio, Saturn in Scorpio, and we have Mercury that moves into Scorpio on the 8th, which then puts four planets clustered. Well, they're not, they're not clustered tightly together, but they're all in Scorpio at a time when Mars is inching closer and closer to its biannual or biennial, biannual, every other year. Um, it's, it's every other year alignment with Pluto. And in, in ancient astrology, Mars is considered to be a malefic not because it's a bad planet, but because it's hard energy to manage. Mars, when tickled the wrong way, instead of like a Taurus going, ooh, a little bit lower, will go, I'll just kill you. <laughs> <laughs> Mars' response, it's the god of war. Mars is quick to anger. It's hot. Pluto, in modern astrology, in some ways is Mars on steroids. In other words, Mars is the god of war, but Pluto is like Vulcan. It's the, it's the intensity and the heat um, that's transformational at the center of the volcano. And it's like if Mars and Scorpio got into a fight, if Mars, Mars and Pluto, I'm, thank you very much, if Mars and Pluto got into a fight, Mars is likely to win on the first hit, but if it doesn't, um, Pluto will always win because Pluto has that staying power of a, it moves so slowly it's like a glacier and, and, and it's not fast but it's relentless and when Mars joins with Pluto that the anger that we have that we haven't expressed turns cold, it's resentment, it can be a strike, it can be a very powerful, um, intense um, uh, overt explosion of energy, but it also can be turning stone cold. Yeah, and interesting you're talking about temperature, hot and cold. Scorpio, there's no sign hotter, but it can also be cold as ice, or at least appear that way on the outside. Agreed. Scorpio can freeze you out, but it can also, you know, take your clothes off and you'll love it and take everything else with it. It can be hot and passionate. So temperature is really interesting because Rick said Mars and Pluto are hot, which together they are, but they're in Capricorn, which is cold. In other words, Mars and Pluto together could be some gangbanger kid in the street or just some aggressive and violent and angry person. Mars and Pluto in Capricorn is a banker who knows that he's taking, he's throwing 300 people out on the street. This is the cold calculated side of aggression, agenda, of murder, agenda. agenda, right. So from a sort of self-protective point of view, be leerier, I think, of the person who acts coldly but has an agenda compared to the person who's showing you that they're angry, that they're pissed off. At least it's out there, they're dealing with it, you're dealing with it, turning it around in a positive sense. Mars conjoined Pluto says, you want to climb Mount Everest? You want to climb your personal Mount Everest? Because Capricorn is climbing, it's ambitious. And Mars and Pluto together give you the juice and the staying power to get wherever you want to go. But you have to plan the trip. 
if you're willing to plan, whether it's a hard discussion with your partner, whether it is a professional move, whether it's changing your body, there's an enormous capacity to, to move in that direction, but it takes a high level of commitment. I, I think what you said is really valuable, and the whole idea of making a plan is really right. important. I know where you're going, yeah. But I think that what's just as important, and especially because it's in Capricorn, is choosing which mountain you're going to climb. Oh, okay. Uh, maybe, yeah. I, I, in, other words, yeah. in other words, there's a calculating aspect to Mars and Pluto, and, and it certainly is an agenda. But if we have a wrong agenda, if we've built an agenda either out of haste or out of fear, those agendas, even if we can come up with a plan and execute it perfectly, we still may end up being screwed because we've climbed the wrong mountain. And so I think here we really have to be careful, cautious. This is Capricorn's strength, is knowing how to hold the energy in to make it last. This is not just about running up the side of a mountain with a plan. Yeah, I think that I think that's very good. So imagine it this way. Whoops, we're, we're taking over, a pause here. Three early. Oh, we had a camera overheating here. Um, Julie's hot hands. Yeah. I was zooming a lot. It's Mars and Pluto. Yeah, it's Mars and Pluto. This is like the new, you know, it's like the technology of the phones, you know. So it's a newer, fancier camera, and it has to overheat. It's like, remember when phones used to work, like, all the time? You know, you know when did you have a drop call in your whole childhood? You didn't have a drop call. Now we have drop calls. Of course, we get other stuff. Are you ready? No. no. We're working on it. Okay. Okay, so Rick made the very important point that whatever you're going after, choose it carefully. Imagine this. Mars and Pluto together are the most powerful weapons you have had for conquering, for breaking through in quite some time. You want to spend them where they matter the most. You want to spend your own energy, your own desire, your own intensity, your own passion, your own anger. Choose carefully, as Rick said, about where you spend it. And because there's four planets in Scorpio, this is even heightened greater. You know, that energy of Pluto, which is transformational and, and, and unstoppable. Uh, there, when, once a nuclear reaction starts, once it's in process, you can't stop it midway. I hate what, when that happens. It happens to you. You start a nuclear reaction. You can't stop it. Once lightning starts to strike, you can't stop it. And so there's this thing about that Mars-Pluto is that the energy is going to play through. And yet there's also a very strong survival aspect about this, and that's where the fear comes in. This is why we need to be careful that we're acting for the highest good rather than acting out of some old fear that has to do with something that we end up taking out an entire nation or village or someone we really care about when we're really just pissed that their collar is crooked. Yeah, from a this 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 doesn't look good from a geopolitical sense, but what month ever looks good from a geopolitical sense? But there's another piece of this, which is where I thought Rick was going. He went to a, a higher mountain, and that is after Mars joins Pluto, it forms a square. It forms a hard right angle to Uranus, the planet of surprise. So Mars is focused in Capricorn, Pluto is focused in Capricorn, and yet we're likely to be sideswiped 
by unexpected events. So in your plan, have a contingency plan. Mm -hmm. That has to be built in. Operate as if you were an emergency worker in which you're ready to take on the toughest thing. The difference is you're choosing what you're going to take on, but there's a reasonable likelihood that something is going to switch gears at a time when you least expect it. And remember, we've been talking, as Jeff noted earlier, for years about the ongoing square between um, erratic, revolutionary, unexpected Uranus and powerful transformation and unrelenting Pluto. Well, this Mars moving through Capricorn, lining up with Pluto and then squaring uh, Uranus just a few days later, even though this aspect isn't exact right now, it's occurred from Earth's point of view six times already, the seventh and final time will happen next March, but in mid-November, when, Mar when Mars makes this translation of energy from Pluto to Uranus, it's like that aspect is exact again, especially with all those planets in Scorpio intensifying the Scorpionic energy. <coughs> Let's move this up to another level of application, and that's consciousness. That's personal growth and awareness. And what Mars can join Pluto and Capricorn square liberating Uranus is about, on one level, is freedom through discipline. Uranus is the principle of freedom. It's in a sign that loves freedom, Aries. Right. And Pluto, which is the deepest fuel cell out there at the end of our solar system in Capricorn, particularly when Mars joins it, is discipline. There are situations in life where you're really free when you're well prepared. If I give a, 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 a serious lecture to an astrology group and I don't prepare, I'm not free. I'm struggling to make sure that I have a track to follow. When I have notes, I'm free to wander away from those notes because I can go back to them. So this really is, and I think it's a, a, a key part of the Uranus-Pluto square, is the understanding of the relationship between discipline, commitment on the one hand, and freedom on the other. They may look like enemies, but it's time to have them be in a dialogue with one another so they're friends. And although that Mars square Uranus is normally very difficult to contain because there is such an erratic, lightning-like, uncontrollable energy escapes and can be like, like just something happens that, that we can't quite control, we have assistance on the control side of this because the same day that Mars squares Uranus, we have Venus, remember we have Mercury, the Sun, Venus and Saturn all clustered in Scorpio. That same day Venus lines up with Saturn and that falls on the side of control. Yeah, it's definitely a black leather day. That combination of looking for the high freaky stimulation. With red leather boots. Uh, right. Uh, <laughs> Of, of, of Mars square Uranus, which is really about freedom or breaking the bonds, Saturn can join Venus alone is about bonds, and in Scorpio, they're even more intense. This is about as complex combination as we can get with relationships, because Venus and Mars are the lovers. Venus is what we want to attract, what we love, what we like. Mars is how we get things done. And they are in such contrasting places where Venus in Scorpio can be, all I want to do here is sit quietly, not say a word, and let's look at each other for the next 12 hours. And Mars square Uranus wants to, let's run around out, so let's get on motorcycles and, and, and ride them up the side of the mountain. There's an enormous contrast between wild and free and tight and controlled. And again, as part of the ongoing theme of the month, I think one of the dangers here is to repress that desire to strike with the lightning, the Mars Uranus, and instead go for the Capricorn control, the Saturn Venus control, the holding it in. And, not, and I'm not suggesting that we should just go out and blatantly do whatever we want, but I think we can err here easily uh, um, by overreacting and by pulling in and going hard, stone, cold, and, and not expressing. Yeah, there, there's a very easy way 
to get a sense of whether you're on the right track with these energies or not. And this is useful lots of other times, but especially clear this month. If you're battling with external authorities, that's your problem. Mars Uranus wants to say screw you to the rule and to the laws and a Venus-Saturn conjunction in Scorpio could to an independent type, to someone who's had enough of their boss, enough of their daily routine, feel so repressive that it can lead to extremely rebellious action. And although there are times in life when oppression is such that that seems to be mm, perhaps the only course of action when you authorize yourself to do something, to create something, to build something, then you're tapping into the power of this because you're owning the energy. I'm giving myself the authority to succeed at a crazy project, to break free of an old pattern because I'm committed, I'm going to show up, and I'm going to do that. That's, giving my, that's empowerment for me. I encourage you to do that for yourself because it's real easy with this to get off on the edge of, you know, life would be good if I didn't have this person. Life would be okay if it wasn't them. You know, it's the damn Republicans. It's the damn Democrats. It's the damn Arabs. It's the damn Jews. It's the damn whatever the hell it is. It's real easy to take a lot of stuff that isn't working in life, put it on your stove of prejudice, cook it up, and throw that crap at somebody else. And you know what Projection. you get there. Projection. What's that? Projection. Projection. Totally. You get a mess, you just add to the mess. So as if that wasn't enough, and let's just review here for a second, we have the Mars-Pluto conjunction on November 10th. We have the Mars square Uranus on the 12th with the Venus conjuncting Saturn also on the 12th. And halfway in the middle, we're not recording. Bear with us here just again for a second, please. Stand up, stretch break. Jeff, Jeff will leave on his uh, <laughs> No, Jeff is getting out another camera. <laughs> Well, you want to give? You think it's got the, sh the shot? I don't know. I don't know how long we're good for now. All right. Well, we'll switch out if we need. Yeah. All right. Thanks for bearing with us here with technical difficulties. Um, as astrologers, we can blame this on Mercury retrograde. Except, except it's Mercury not. isn't retrograde. That, that's right. But Mercury was retrograde. And it will be retrograde again. So. so screw Mercury. So quick review. Mars conjuncts Pluto on November 10th. Mars squares Uranus on November 12th. That in itself is very powerful on the 12th. We also have the, the serious side, the isolating Venus conjuncting Saturn. In the middle of that, on the 11th, Mercury which has moved into Scorpio, forms a harmonious trine with Neptune, which introduces the poet or the artist or the dreamer into this mix, which I think can really help. It can help if we're aware of it, but it also can be an escape. Right. The escape is the illusion, bullshitting ourselves and bullshitting others. But the right. positive side of intellectual mercury in a harmonious alignment with magical, spiritual, poetic Neptune is to soften the hard edges of our mind. I mean, it's very interesting. We could feel broke and unloved with a Saturn-Venus conjunction in Scorpio mm -hmm. and pissed off and ready to knock down the nearest um, uh, uh, symbol of authority in the area. But the Mercury trying Neptune says, ah, you know, maybe she's not so tough. Maybe he's not such a bad guy. That the poetry is really about using the mind to make connections, to see larger patterns of spirit and of energy and meaning that go beyond the rough edges of Mars-Uranus 
and Venus Saturn. So, you know, look, I don't think it can make things harder. There is hope this month, a lot of hope. And in fact, we're moving towards Sagittarius, the sign of hope. But we do have on the 9th, we had Venus square Jupiter, which is which is kind of a, an overindulgence, an, an escape valve, if you will. That's on the 9th, just as this other stuff is still building. But then we have the sun that moves into a square with Jupiter. And, the 13th. And that's yeah, on the, what would you say, on the 13th. 13th yeah. And here we have the sense of the possibilities of what can occur. We can take it too far because with Jupiter, it's always easy to take it too far. But I think in some ways, this, is, this can be a break in that heavy energy. It gives us somewhere to move it, even if we take it too far too quick. Yeah, and, and the energy is beginning to shift yes. around the middle of the month. Neptune, the planet of spirituality, turns direct or begins regaining forward movement on the 15th, which means its idealism in principle may be more easily expressed. The day after that, Venus gets out of Scorpio and enters Sagittarius, Yay. where the principle of love is taken from deep desire and fear of loss to open exploration and optimism that something more interesting is happening around the next corner. It's the beginning of the next adventure. Even if we're not there yet, we begin to long for the excitement rather than mucking about and hanging out in the depth. You know, again, it's not that it, it one sign is bad or another is good. There's something very profound and magical and transformational and intense with that Venus and Scorpio. But when it moves into Sagittarius, we're now like outside in our, you know, um, North Face parka and all of our winter you know, camping equipment, and we're ready to climb the mountain just because it's there and it's an adventure, not because we have to. Yeah, and because we've stopped looking back. Scorpio yeah, looks down, right. in, and back. Sagittarius looks up and out. Now, the sun does join Saturn and Scorpio on the 18th of the month. That's like the last sort of big lump in the oatmeal. <laughs> that you know that that bit of seriousness that that sense it's a of big having, lump of having to swallow something that doesn't necessarily go down so easily but as with every astrological pattern depends what you bring to it if you bring commitment focus purpose all good saturn words well that's like getting a great spinal adjustment and lining yourself up to advance your interest in life. Well, we often think of Saturn as the contracting or the constricting energy of the, of the universe, but in fact, it's also the crystallization. And so that whole idea when the sun and Saturn lines up, if there are things that you've been planning on or working on or things that you've been dreaming about, you may not be able to manifest them as quickly as you'd like, but this is a time to pull in and to plant that seed to to actually make that sense of self determination and say this is what it's going to take and this is that make the commitment it's a time for commitment i think yes specifically that day and as we pointed out pretty much the whole first half of the month and with commitment and patience come the willingness to have delayed gratification to put in the the work and the effort now for something better later. And we're in an interesting twist here because Venus in Sagittarius, she runs ahead into Sagittarius on the 16th. Oh, mommy, daddy, let's play. Look at that over there. And the sun is not yet ready to go, meaning attraction is ahead of the capacity to make it so. Once we pass through that last ring of Saturn on the 18th, uh, for the most part, we're in a period of time here in the U.S. as we approach Thanksgiving of, again, looking further ahead than being held back by the past. Well, and in fact, on the 22nd, we're going to switch gears, I think. Right, right we're going to downgrade technology. <laughs> Do 
do. Right, right. We, we, this is all demo stuff. This is all planned. Does that work? Remember how to, z remember how to zoom? We back? All right. So you ready for November 22nd? Well, yes. Um, on November 22nd, the sun very early in the morning here on the West Coast moves out of Scorpio and into Sagittarius, followed by the moon. And we have just a few hours later a new moon at zero degrees at the very, 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 very beginning of Sagittarius. This is like a fresh start to everything. It feels like it, it feels like we're, we're, we just got out of jail for free. It's pretty bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, for sure. A new moon is always the beginning of a new cycle. A new moon in a fire sign like Sagittarius uh, certainly is forward-looking. We have Venus nearby. This is looking forward to new forms of pleasure. Now, are we going to get them? Are we going to reach them? Well, if we've taken care of business before, we've got a better chance of making it home alive from the cruise that we really couldn't afford to go on in the first place. But this is not about losing responsibility. It's just shifting the focus away from the limits of what is to the possibility of what hasn't happened yet. Scorpio tends to focus on loss Sag or the potential for it. Sagittarius does not. And while that can be naive and foolish, it also can dose us with gallons of optimism that help us enjoy our lives and have higher expectations for what's to come. Well, yeah, and this in a way is the it's before we get delusioned, before we get, before we become delusioned about the holiday season. It's like we're at the front end of it. There's the sense of, of innocence and hope and the possibility and that this year I'm going to do it differently. And all of that stuff is cooking um, as the planets first move into Sagittarius. And again, just like Halloween is the Scorpio holiday where the veil between worlds is very, very thin and things from the other side leak through and, and we communicate with the dead. The holiday of Sagittarius is Thanksgiving. It's the first Thursday or Thor's Day, which is Jupiter in the Norwegian, uh, in the Norse gods. And, and, and Thanksgiving is the first Jupiter day after the sun moves into Jupiter's sign, Sagittarius, mm -hmm. and there's that sense of hope and optimism and fellowship and all that positive stuff, even if it really is just a fake story. Yeah, and, and <laughs> if there is a fake well, story, um, Mercury, It still can inspire us, though. It can, you know, who needs the truth if it's going to depress us? Sometimes a good lie is inspirational. It depends. It depends. But the, there's the child pointing out the BS in our stories on the 25th as Mercury joins Saturn in Scorpio. Saturn's hard, cold reality. Mercury is the facts. And Scorpio is sometimes the facts that are not readily visible. So that can be a more mentally focused, mentally intense, but possibly a profoundly honest day as well. It's another lump in the oatmeal. You told me there were no more lumps, no, no, Daddy. No, 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 no. It, it's, it's a stale raisin. It's a little different. You just suck on it long enough. It'll it's a lump. soften up. It's it'll a lump. Be, it'll be fine. It's a lump. It's a baby grape. Just think of it as a baby grape. That's all. The fact is that, that there's still something on this day that is still hard to swallow or hard to chew, and yet... <laughs> And yet everything else is escape. We're in this process of escaping this, the dark side into the side of optimism and hope. And I think every year we talk about this time of year. I always talk about a, um, a concept that my Buddhist friends call the tyranny of hope. Because there's something about hope that, take, that, that diminishes the power of now. Because hope is in the future. And so as long as, as, long as we're in the Sagittarian framework... Of, of both the Sun now and Venus 
and very soon thereafter, just a couple days later, I think on the 28th, Mercury also enters Sagittarius. And then early next month, Saturn finally enters Sag Sagittarius. We have all of this hope, and yet in some ways it can make us less, less connected and less active to what we need to do right now because we just know things are going to get better. Yeah, th this idea is expressed in a branch of astrology called esoteric astrology, basically created by the occultist Alice Bailey, or at least codified, if you can call her, a stuff codified, codified the late, for a Gemini. In, in, the, in, the, in the late 1900s. But at any rate, there, she talks about the esoteric rulers. That is, that planets, there's another set of relationships between planets and signs that reveals a deeper spiritual meaning. The Earth is the esoteric ruler of Sagittarius. What that means is that half horse, half archer is likely to hit the target if we're connected to the Earth. Hope rooted in earthly reality is a vessel that can take us far. And hope unrooted in the Earth of reality is a bubble is a balloon, is an illusion that can be popped in a moment. One very other important thing, we're now pushing toward the end of the month. On the 27th, actually, Mercury leaves Scorpio and enters Sagittarius too. But on the day before that, we have Venus in Sagittarius making a harmonious trine with Uranus and Aries. And I think the, the month really ends with this sense of, of, of all the possibilities, all the things that could happen. We're attracted to trying things that are new and different. And, and I think that we're, we're feeling less restrained from the heaviness of what so much of November is. Yeah, and, and, and what late December and January may be. I mean, every sign is beautiful and has its purpose. But Scorpio and Capricorn are two of the toughest. Yeah. And perhaps the glee, the joy, and the escapism of Sagittarius is because that's the, the neighboring signs. So enjoy the flights of philosophy and fantasy and imagination with at least one hoof on the ground so that we can move through this darkening period of the year here in the Northern Hemisphere with some light in our hearts and in our minds about where we're going. All there's, right. There's a month. There's a month. So we're going to take a short break. After the break, Rick and I are going to look at three charts. We're going to do very quick little mini readings. If you'd like us to look at your chart, put your first name, your time, date, place of birth, and your email address on a piece of paper. Leave it on the table here behind Julie, and we will pick three of you to do a demonstration with. And remember that Soul Food uh, is a community center, so to speak. Uh, they stay in business by your patronage. This night is, uh, is not a night of you do not pay for it. You pay for it by the coffee you drink and the things that you buy. So please vote with your economic capability. Don't buy the gift down the block and uh, up the street at the big department store. Instead, buy it here tonight. Spend a little money. Spread the joy. Vote with your pocketbook. We'll see you after the break in about 15 minutes. Remember, if you want your chart done, your name, your birth date, place, and time, and your email address on a piece of paper. See you shortly. And the last four digits of your social security. 